today's uh, New Testament study, and for you guys, we take questions at the end. I have chosen a unique name, uh, the Microscope of Reality, and I chose that name because of a recent uh, conversation I had with some other friends of mine from college 35 years ago who are not in this walk and were asking me a number of questions and a number of the answers I gave dealt with the reality of the first and second century the way people live their lives so I just I don't know it just kinda came to me as a good title so first we're gonna talk about what it is then I have a review which is gonna be very quick we've got to mention the millennial kingdom and the Torah and then finally we're gonna do my timeline which is very impressive Dave this is for you that because you're gonna be doing a PowerPoint presentation and you should be very impressed with it <laughs> okay so I have a I have a an analogy I like I hope it's close enough I chose microscope because everybody who has dealt with general science in school some people in their careers know that the microscope is used as a tool for examination and we need to use it in the same way I'm using it kind of as a metaphor but the reality is we need to examine the things that took place what was said versus what took place is kind of the thing you can interpret what somebody says sometimes more than one way if they say it in a general sense but if you want to find out what took place you look at the reality and then you understand you can go back and interpret properly so that's why this is talking about interpretation um, through the microscope of reality okay I have an analogy here many of us are, are familiar with some of the history prior to the beginning of World War II when Adolf Hitler came to power one of the things he did initially was to sign a non-aggression pact against Poland or with Poland in 1934 and he did this for political reasons he wanted to have a chance to rearm without anybody getting upset the rest of uh, Europe was in a passive mode so this worked to his ability a person reading the non-aggression pact would come away with interpretation that, that meant that he would not have an aggressive posture against Poland problem was it only lasted for five years in September 1st of 1939 as history has dictated or has related to us uh, he invaded Poland All right. so looking back at the document that he signed non-aggression didn't really mean non-aggression since the reality of what happened demonstrated aggression and I wanted to show that just because something's written the way you interpret it you need to look at the reality of how it plays out before you lock down what the interpretation means and this is one of the things that I've had to battle with coming from a Southern Baptist background and dealing with Hebrew roots and I'm not going to give the information but they did the same thing with Russia non-aggression pact and then they attacked Russia so alright here's the review Acts 15 these are things we've already covered in previous meetings so um, this is just to refresh your memory Acts 15 we were taught that I was taught that uh, Gentiles have to do four things and that's it obviously that is very ridiculous but once we go back and deal with Leviticus 17 and 18 we find out that the same thing with Moses deals with the Gentiles coming in they gotta have a place to start first Corinthians 5 6 through 8 you remember that Paul said let us keep the feast well there's been a lot of twisting and turning to try to get that to not be let's keep the feast but that hasn't worked out well in Acts 21 Paul and James get together to discuss some issues there have been some rumors circulating that Paul in his letters has been teaching that you are not to keep the law but he made it clear that he was going to do these things James said in verse 24 if you do these things then everyone will know the rumors are false and that you are keeping Torah and that you are walking the way you should walk so we've gotten through that Clement of Rome Clement of Rome was a bishop at the end of the first century and while we have talked about him in a very minimal sense I had some uh, quotes that I wanted to tell you about that are going to help set the stage for reality and I'll tell you why I was under a misconception and I'm going to share that with you but first I want to quote first Clement this is around chapter 40 and 41 whatever the Lord has commanded us to perform we ought to do it in accordance with the appointed seasons okay well what might be an appointed season 
He continues. He commanded the offerings and services to be performed conscientiously and not at random or without order, but at appointed seasons. All right. Now, this quote is in Dr. Carrington's book, and he says, Since Clement goes on to refer to the high priest, the priests, and the Levites, it's clear that the appointed seasons, which he regards as essential, must be those of the Levitical law. Now, I know that Clement was at the end of the first century, and I also understand that the temple was destroyed sometime around A.D. 70. I took that without doing any study whatsoever. I took that to mean that the sacrifice has ended. I didn't know I was wrong. Okay? The sacrifice has continued. I did not know this until recent. I have, I'll have the evidence for you later. But that makes what Clement says, it actually makes sense now. That's why this is here. Dr. Carrington goes on to say, if words have any meaning at all, a liturgical year of the Hebrew type must have been well established in Rome and Corinth by the 90s. Now, I'm not worried about Corinth. We already addressed that with 1 Corinthians 5. But the fact that a liturgical year in which way we're going to Jerusalem for the three feasts to do the sacrifices from Rome was like shocking to my system. Very shocking to my system. His final quote is, there is no reason to think that there ever was a form of Christianity anywhere which dispensed with this calendar. I was just like, man, now it is making sense. The sacrifices, if you would like to look into more information on the sacrifices, worship in the Jerusalem temple by, in AD 70 by Dr. Clark is in New Testament studies. And from the rabbinic side, the temple and sacrifice in rabbinic Judaism is by J.R. Brown. And this talks about it from the rabbinic side. So we have two different sides coming in. That ends that part. Now let's go continue with our review. Galatians 5 and circumcision. This is where we looked at the text to discover that the word circumcision did not mean just circumcision, the cutting of the flesh. So we understood that there was a proselyte conversion issue, and we addressed that. That was last month. Then Matthew 5.17, while I have a lot of Christian scholars who have commented on this, I'm only going to give one. This is from the International Critical Commentary, which was the commentary of standard for the last uh, century, the 20th century. And here's what they said. In Matthew 5.17, the meaning of the words is clear. Christ did not come to overthrow the authority of the Mosaic law, which was to be eternally binding upon the hearts and consciences of men. Excuse me, this is Protestant Christian scholars that wrote this. So long as the world lasted, its authority was to be permanent. And then they get a little sharp with their own friends. Commentators have exhausted their ingenuity in attempts to explain away this passage, but its meaning is too clear to be misunderstood. So Matthew 17 does not provide us with a problem. Galatians 5 does not provide us with a problem. Colossians 2, 14 through 23, but especially in 16 and 17, used to provide us with a major problem, but not anymore. In an evaluation... And this kind of falls on the heels of the new perspective of Paul, which is happening within Christian scholarship the last 50 years. Who is Paul warning against? As we found, he was warning against somebody coming in and telling these people, these believers in Colossae, who were Gentiles, that you are feasting too much during the feast. Well, that's just bad. All right? We also discussed the problem of translations. Our versus we were. Our verses were. The Greek text is these, the festival new moons and Sabbaths are a shadow of things to come. The in, new international version says these things were a shadow of things to come. We already addressed grammar is important, especially in verb tenses. Don't want to mislead people. But there's, we have a new problem. If you read the NIV and the NAS in Acts 18.21, this is what it says. But as he left, he promised... Notice my brackets in yellow. I will come back if it's God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. But what about the KJV and the ISR and the Greek New Testament? But bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you if God will, and he sail from Ephesus. The yellow is what's been removed from the text. Okay, and anybody who has a question, here's UBS, number three. It's all the Greek New Testament. 
has all the critical textual commentary. Anybody who wants to check me. The extra words, there's a study done in Novum Testamentum. This is available in the library locally in Richmond. It's called The Extra Words in Acts 18.21. And the last part of the review, I told you guys that I would bring in the Greek text of the New Testament Bible. I brought in page 1278, and I'm going to show it to you. This deals with the creation of Mark fulfilling the prophecy of Deuteronomy 18. And here it is. This is the Greek text. I know it's hard for you to read. This, you can see up in the upper left-hand corner, is 1278. And the dark section at the top there, this is the back side. So this is page two, really page one. If you flipped it over, you'd have page one of the book of Mark, and you'd have the extension of Matthew. Some of Matthew's actually bled through, but you probably can't see it on the screen. I can see it on my screen. But what I'm going to show you is where they designed Mark to line up with the Torah portions in the first century. Here's the first one. If you look at the gamma, alpha, beta, gamma, there it is right there. I've circled it. You see the line over top, which means to read it as a number. It was the third reading. Follow that by delta. There's your fourth reading. Epsilon is your fifth reading. And you can even see at epsilon where the Greek text has actually been moved to the left by a whole letter column-wise to designate this is the next reading to go with the Torah portion. This is the Greek text. This is the entire Bible. That's why at 1278, we've already done the whole Old Testament in Greek, and this is the New Testament. So this is the Greek text that I told you about. And here I drew an arrow so you can see where the Greek text is af actually offset by a letter. There is my Greek that I promised I'd bring. Okay, that ends our review. Now, we need to move to the Millennial Kingdom. There's a, there's a number of passages to talk about the Millennial Kingdom. I've picked two. We'll go with those two. Micah 4, verse 1. In the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of Yahweh shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. 2. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh and to the house of the Elohim of Jacob. Now, what happens when we get there? He will teach us our, his ways. We will walk in his paths. Parallelism. For the Torah shall go forth out of Zion, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. Three. He'll judge among many people. Rebuke strong nations afar off. That does not mean my next door neighbor. And they shall beat their swords in the plowshares, and their spears in the pruning hooks. I believe that quote is uh, somewhere famous. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Wow, a thousand years with no war. That would be different. And finally, verse 4, for the mouth of Yahweh of hosts has spoken it. So there's one passage. Now let's go over to Zechariah, another one of my favorites. Verse 16, it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came up against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, and to keep... The Feast of Tabernacles. Yes, folks, that feast that was done away with at the death of Christ, they will reinstitute it during the Millennial Kingdom. Yeah, that's what I was taught. 17. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, Yahweh of hosts, even upon them there shall be no rain. 18. And if the family of Egypt go not up, they will have no rain, and there shall be the plague wherewith Yahweh will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Wow. Can't wait for that one world order, huh? All right, there's your millennial kingdom picture. Now, if the Torah is going to be the Constitution, we should take a quick peek at it and find out what it is. All right, I start with my opening slide. What is Torah? Well, the word Torah means to shoot an arrow or hit the mark. Probably could put some others in there, too. I like those two myself. My position. Torah can be understood as the operating manual for the planet Earth. I think that's good. General sense. Instruction about how to live rightly before God and with mankind. Concerning our observance of the Torah, we believe it is a reflection of his divine nature resident within us. We don't observe it, 
because it's the correct thing to do, although it is. We observe it because it is now in our changed nature to do so, just as the prophets predicted. Gosh, it wasn't a new thing after all. Here's some highlights of Psalm 19. As you know, David has been claimed as the author. Plus some interesting insight here. The instructions of our Heavenly Father are complete. No missing parts. And provide what's needed to return a soul who has gone astray. The witness of Yahweh is faithful and enduring. Making wise the simple. His precepts are equitable and just. Rejoicing the heart. The terms of the covenant between him and myself are without any impurities. Reverencing Yahweh has a cleansing effect that endures. His judicial requirements are faithful into perpetuity. More to be desired than gold. That puts a value on it. And observing them, there is great reward. Who can discern? Catch this one. Who can discern wandering off the straight and narrow path without the Torah? This text is my personal translation of the Hebrew, kind of expanded, just to kind of give a bigger picture. Now, we've heard David's perspective. Let's listen to what Moses is told to tell the people. Keep, therefore, and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall say, which shall hear all these statues and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as Yahweh our Elohim is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this Torah, which I set before you this day. Yes, this is the Torah that is lower than the dust today. Okay? Just to put it in perspective. All right, we can't end the Torah discussion without Paul's perspective. So he talks to Timothy and says, From a child, that's before the New Testament was written, excuse me, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to do what? Make you wise unto salvation through faith. It was already there. I like it. And here's what verse 16 says. I've broken it out. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for learning. For learning what? What's right? What's not right? How to get it right? And how to keep it right? That's what it says. So here's my conclusions. In the millennial kingdom, this is the Torah that all the people in the entire world will keep. Now I ask you, and I did this for my friend Mark, who's currently taking math classes in college. It's a math equation. If ruling and reigning equals enforcing, you can get the answer to me later. We're called to rule and reign for a thousand years. Isn't that enforcing Torah? Let me ask you a question. If you were asked tomorrow to enforce Torah in your community, could you do it? Have you ever even read it? Do you know the difference between a statue and a judgment? Do you even know what a statue and a judgment are? Are you ready to rule and reign and educate the world on Torah today? Because that's what we're going to be doing. All right, that ends our Torah. Now it's time to do evidence from history. If we're on point with our conclusions so far, history should be able to substantiate it. So... Let's do the timeline. And here it is. I hear that laughter in the back of the room. Please restrain yourself. <laughs> James, the year 30. I ran out of time. I couldn't make this as pretty as I would have liked. The next time this happens, it'll be 3D with colors flying around the screen. James in AD 30. We know that he was ruling the church. Poly uh, Polycarp was born somewhere between 66 and 69. I didn't know which one is accurate. The scholars seem to be somewhat divided, but the consensus seems to be 69, so I put it there. He studied under the Apostle John for 20 years. In the approximately A.D. 70, the temple was destroyed. In 85, 
Mr. Little, I forgot his first name, Samuel, Samuel the Little, I believe was his name, uh, reorganized the Amidah so that in the Jewish synagogue there would be a curse for some of the people who were attending. And these would be people who keep Torah but have the testimony of Yeshua as a part of their life. Okay? So that's Amidah around 85. Then in 96, I already covered Clement of Rome. You already saw about the sacrifices and the Levites. Ignatius is in 98. Now, Ignatius, you know, Ignatius has been character assassinated. All right? So, now, he, I'm not saying that I agree with every church father, everything they wrote. But they got a lot of things right, and I picked out that group. All right, so I'm going to give you some verses, three, from Ignatius, uh, Epistle to the uh, Magnesians. But this is retranslated from the Greek, not through a mindset of um, Sunday, Sabbath, the law's been done away with. 8.1. Be not seduced by strange doctrines, nor by antiquated fables, which are profitless. For if even unto this day we live according to the manner of Judaic concepts, Who's he talking about? He's talking about rabbinic Judaism that had already formed. We admit that we have not received grace. For the godly prophets lived the way Yeshua did without the traditions. Nine, if then those who had walked in ancient practices attained unto newness of hope, no longer Judaically keeping Sabbaths, but keeping them according to how our Lord kept them. That's a whole different twist on the passage because I didn't go through it here. I have another presentation where I break down the fraud that's been propagated for the last three centuries on this passage where they have replaced words, put in other words, and not even told you about it. We've spoke of that in the past, but I'm just bringing it to you because I retranslated it from the Greek. As you can see, Ignatius was not as bad as he's been made out to be. Here's the longer recension. Let every one of you keep the Sabbath after a spiritual manner, rejoicing in meditation on the law. Man, where is Ignatius Church so I can go there? The Apostle John, as we all know, he uh, went into exile, but then he came out. All right? And I have a couple quotes that I wanted to show you. What happened when John finished his exile? Here we go. After the tyrant's death, John returned from the Isle of Patmos to Ephesus. He went upon their invitation to the neighboring territories of the Gentiles to appoint bishops in some places, in other places to set in order whole churches, elsewhere to choose to the ministry some one of those that were pointed out by the Spirit. There's our apostle. And... Oh, this is, for those who want to track this down, this is Book 3, Chapter 23. The church in Ephesus, this is Arrhenius' quote, founded by Paul, and having John remaining among them permanently, is a true witness of the apostles. So here we have two church fathers talking about it. And this is his work, Book 3, Chapter 3. After we cross over the 100 mark, you know, there's different emperors. Well, Hadrian comes into office, and he, wants, he does not like things that are Jewish, all right? And that's going to be a problem when we get to Bar Kokhba. What happened at Bar Kokhba was 132 to 135, there was the rebellion against Rome, which was crushed by Rome. During that time, Rabbi Akiva, who has been kindly referred to as the father of rabbinic Judaism because of the way he organized things, selected Bar Kokhba as the Messiah, which required the people, if the Messiah declared that we were now fighting the millennial war to break away from Rome, everybody had to do it. Well, the Jewish Christians knew that this was a false Messiah, so they could not do it, so they turned, they were found guilty of treason, and they were murdered in the tens of thousands. Okay, this is all historical. So there was a problem during this time but they were crushed. Yeah, the whole time that Hadrian was in office, the Jews are constantly doing these skirmishes, causing problems, and I understand why they did it, but it caused us major problems. 
because we're getting close to a place of division in which Hadrian had to put his foot down. And as you know, Jews were not allowed back in Jerusalem after 135, and the city was renamed. So I'm going to continue with that information. What happened since the Jews could not come in? Well, obviously, you could not have Jewish bishops running the Jerusalem church. So we're going to have Gentile bishops take over. But there are some pieces of information about the Jewish bishops that you need to know. The first 15 bishops of Jerusalem were all circumcised Jews, and the congregation over which they presided united the law of Moses with the doctrine of Christ. That's a good quote. It was natural that the primitive tradition of a church, which was founded only 40 days after the death of Christ, I thought it was 50, but, you know, I'm just, I wrote the quote the way it exists in the text, and was governed almost as many years under the immediate inspection of his apostles, should be received as the standard of orthodoxy. Wow, somebody gets it. It has been remarked that the virgin purity of the church was never violated by schism, hope that's the correct pronunciation, or heresy before the reign of Trajan or Hadrian, about 100 years after the death of Christ. Where is this from? Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by E. Gibbon. Next quote. The Jewish Christians, at least in Palestine, conformed as closely as possible to the venerable forms of the cultus of their fathers. Now look at this next phrase. Which in truth were divinely ordained. Excuse me, did you just say that Torah was divinely ordained? Wow. Uh, what's the next phrase? And we're an expressive type of Christian worship? Gosh, I haven't been taught that recently. So far as we know, they scrupulously observe the Sabbath, the annual Jewish feasts, the hours of daily prayer, and the whole Mosaic ritual. History of the Christian Church by Philip Schaff. These are two gentlemen who have spent pretty much their scholarly careers doing the history of the early church. Just, just amazing stuff. Okay, so now we see that Hadrian brought the rebellion to an end, which forced the end of Jewish bishops because no Jews were allowed in Jerusalem, which meant if the church was going to exist, they had to have Gentile bishops. So what are they going to do? Well, this is what they're going to do. From that same book, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Hadrian brought the rebellion to an end, which forced the end of Jewish bishops because no Jews were allowed in Jerusalem, which meant if the church was going to exist, they had to have Gentile bishops. So what are they going to do? Well, this is what they're going to do. From that same book, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, they elected Marcus for their bishop, a prelate of the race of the Gentiles, and most probably a native, either of Italy or of some of the Latin providences. At his persuasion, the most considerable part of the congregation renounced the Mosaic Law, which, by the way, had been outlawed now, in the practice of which they had persevered above a century. If Christ was uh, crucified before 35, this is taking place in 135, that's a century. By this sacrifice of their habits and prejudices, they purchased a free admission into the colony of Hadrian. What does that sentence mean? It means that since the Mosaic Law was now outlawed in Jerusalem, if you will continue to be a church and you give up the law, you get to live here in Jerusalem and attend this church, and we will not put you to death. That's what the last part of that phrase means. So this is where it all began. The Jews are destroyed. The temple and sacrifices are destroyed. Observing Torah is against the law. Gentile bishops have been put into office. What are we to do? Prior to this action, he says, the Jewish bishops insisted on the literal observance of the law. Once again, what we see is there was a consistency for the hundred years until the revolt of the false Messiah, and then it all got blown up. You can read more of those quotes from Eusebius' Church History. This is Book 4, Chapter 5. I have learned this much from writings, 
that until the siege of the Jews, which took place under Adrian, which really should be Hadrian, but I tell you the truth, I copied this correctly, there were 15 bishops in succession there, all of whom are said to have been of Hebrew descent. They, oh my goodness, look at this quote from Eusebius, the church father, third century. They received the knowledge of Christ in purity so that they were approved by those who were able to judge of such matters and were deemed worthy of the episcopate. Don't worry about that big word there at the end. This is saying that they received the knowledge of Christ without error, and they managed it that way for a hundred years. So wouldn't you think that if there's a radical change after that point, that perhaps they're not pursuing the knowledge of Christ in purity? Did anybody think of that? No, that's sad. But here it is, right here by Eusebius. Now, we're going to move 15 years later. What has happened? Clamp down on Jerusalem. Jewish bishops gone. Gentile bishops in. Let's cancel the Mosaic Law. 15 years later, Rome, and we just saw 50 years earlier, Clement is taking sacrifices for the feast going down to Jerusalem and doing it in an orderly fashion according to the appointed times. Now it's stopped. So what is Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, going to do? He's going to go to Rome, and he's going to call it into question. So, an epistle, and it's to the Philippians, and he speaks in the most glowing and excellent terms concerning Paul. So I ask you, if he's going to talk about keeping Torah, and if Paul did away with it, would he have spoke highly of Paul? That is a question. I don't think so. So let's go to the actual debate between him and the Bishop of Rome in approximately 150. When the blessed Polycarp was at Rome in the time of Anicetus, and they disagreed a little about certain other things besides when to observe the Passover, probably about why aren't you observing Torah anymore, they were immediately made peace with one another, not caring to quarrel over this matter. Interesting. Anicetus could not persuade Polycarp to stop observing what he had always observed with John the disciple of our Lord and the other apostles with whom he associated. Couldn't stop him. On the other flip, Polycarp couldn't persuade Anicetus to observe it as he said, I ought to follow the customs of the presbyters that had preceded him. And I added, no matter what the apostles taught and handed down, that's basically what he said. I just added it in to be clear. We can date this. Epiphanes from the 4th century, another church father. The controversy arose concerning Passover after the exodus of the bishops of the circumcision, Jewish bishops, 135. And how long did it last? Did they constantly have this problem about observing Torah? Into the 4th century. In this writing, and this is Panarium, 50 and 70, he then makes reference to the 15 bishops. They kept the 14th day of the first month, as is found in the Apostolic Constitutions. And he quotes the Apostolic Constitutions, and look at this. You Gentile Christians ought to celebrate Passover at the same time as your brethren, who from the circumcision have entered the church. He's explaining to this person, asking him a question, why did they do that? Well, because the apostolic constitution said that they were supposed to do it. And this was the quote. Now we move to Polygrates, 195. We are now 45 years later, and we still have divergency. Let me introduce the bishop of Ephesus. Here's his background. He lived totally in the second century. One of the things he's most well known for is presiding over a meeting of Asian bishops to codify Roman Easter because a divergent method existed. The bishop of Rome at the time was Victor, and Victor, I put requested, but when I was reading the actual literature, it said demanded. So, but I didn't get back to edit that, so I put requested. All right, let's take a look. Here's what happened. Polygrates calls together bishops from all over Asia and surrounding nations. And they have this meeting of all the bishops to discuss stopping observing Passover, according to how the apostles taught us to do it, and let's start observing Easter on Sunday as Victor wants to do it. 
So they had a meeting, and they discussed scripture, and then they came to a conclusion, and Polygrates was chosen to write the letter that would explain their conclusions and send it to Victor. Here we go. Concerning Passover, we scrupulously observe the exact day, neither adding nor taking away. Sound like Deuteronomy 4.2 to you? For in Asia, also great lights have fallen asleep. Among these are the apostles, Philip and John, Polycarp, others. This shows a line of agreement. All these observe the 14th day of the month in accordance with the gospel. There's no observance of the 14th day of the month in the gospel. At least not the one I read. Oh, that's because the gospel's Torah. Because that's the only place the 14th month's found. Oops. They all observe the 14th day of the month in accordance with the gospel. Deviating in no respect, but following the rule of faith. Another document handed down in the early centuries. Seven of my relatives were bishops. I'm the eighth. That's an illustrious line. And my relatives always observe the day when the people put away the leaven. Well, is there a passage in the Gospels that talks about when to put away the leaven? Nope. You're only going to find it in one place. And that's the Torah. I've met with the brethren throughout the world. Remember, Victor required him to do this. And with these brethren have gone through every Holy Scripture. That includes the New Testament. That includes everything that Paul wrote. Excuse me. I could mention the bishops who were present, whom I summoned at your desire, who names would constitute a great multitude. All right, now. You know, I could ask for hands here, and we could see the word unanimous. Could we agree that we're all wearing clothes? Yes, we would have a unanimous yes on that. But outside of that, I'm not sure there's anything else, theologically speaking, that we could be unanimous on. Okay? But here's the scoop. These are the bishops of the assemblies in Asia and the surrounding nations who have gone through the scriptures and looked at the 14th day of the first month for the removal of leaven for Passover, and here's what they gave. Their unanimous consent to the letter that we're not going to change. He closes the letter to Victor by saying, I'm not frightened at the things which are said to terrify us. Oh, I should tell you that Victor said, um, call everybody together and tell them you're going to observe Sunday because if you don't, I'm cutting you off. Forgot to tell you that. He continues, for those who are greater than I have said, we ought to obey God rather than men. I think Peter might have been one of those. So here's the summary of Polygrates' position. He was a follower of the teacher's uh, teachings of the apostles, faithful to teachings of the gospel, which surprisingly includes the Torah. Obeying God's word was more important than following a man's tradition. Now there's a shocking point. That third one there rocks the boat. The evidence of the biblical imprint passed down from Jerusalem assembly doesn't stop with polygrates. I used to always give this presentation. I stop with polygrates. It doesn't stop there. Let me show you another one. Then we'll finish up with polygrates jump ahead a little bit 180 to 223 my disciples sanctify Sunday and not Saturday and they do not practice circumcision as the Christians in Judea man this is third century and they're still practicing circumcision in Judea and it's not the Jews he wrote the Christians hey what can you say and this is from Baghetti another historian Okay, now, let's get back to Polygrates and Victor, because we want to wrap that up. So this letter gets delivered to Victor. He reads it, and he's got some serious decisions to make. So what decision does he make? Let's communicate the entire nation. What happens? Iranius rebukes him. So what did Victor do? We've got to be politically correct. All right, this is what we'll do. We're going to have a council next year. We're going to hold it in Caesarea. And you know what we're going to do? We're not going to invite any of the bishops from Asia. And we're going to discuss celebrating Easter. And we're all going to agree. And it's going to be great. Glory to God in the highest. And that's exactly what happened. 
Easter was approved. Conclusions. Got a couple. This is the picture that has emerged. The apostles set up the feast calendar. We got Colossians 2, which supports that Paul was rebuking people for interfering with the feasting of the Gentiles. 1 Corinthians 5, keep the feast. Mark equals the fulfillment of the prophecy given to Moses in Deuteronomy 18 to correspond with whatever he says you must do, there it is. Then we have the problem of the Amidah. It wasn't a big problem, but it was a little problem. And I'm not going to tell you who these people were that were being addressed. I'm just going to tell you they were keeping Torah and they were maintaining the testimony of Yeshua. You figure out who that is. We got Clement in Rome. Rome still in the fold. We got this revolt. You know, I used to have a problem with this revolt. Now I got a more problem with this revolt because this caused us a lot of problems. No more Jewish leadership in Jerusalem church, which leads to what? Removal of Torah and power transfer to Rome. This is what has cost us. I want to put that quote back up again. The Jewish bishops received the knowledge of Christ in purity. They were approved by those who were able to judge of such matters and were deemed worthy of the episcopate. So what happened to those that followed them that did away with everything? My question still stands. So, where are we? Well, we've already done Galatians 4 and 5. We did Romans 10. We did Colossians 2. There are others that we need to still get out and scrape away a buildup of flawed analyses. I mean, we got some work to do, but we're dressing it. Matthew 7, the road traveled, and Luke 13, the straight gate, pose interesting questions that we need to be able to answer. This is a Greek word. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I am going to tell you what it means. From Freiburg, it says, contend for prize. Make every effort, try very hard, do one's very best. It is a literal word for the public games in the first century. And this is what it means, and I will put it into the vernacular of our century today in the Olympic Games. Let's say that you are a mile runner. You are on a track that's a quarter mile. You have made three complete laps. You're now in the fourth lap. This is the final lap. You have made the final turn. What you do now from the final turn to the line that you have to cross to win, what you do is what this word means. This will determine whether you win or you don't. That's where the word was used literally in the first century. Now, you need to know what the rest of this verse says. All right? I'm going to use strive, but we could use try very hard, do your very best, make every effort. I'm going to use the word strive. You ready? Oh, I'm sorry. I just repeated this just so we could have it in our mind. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and will not be able. Wow. Make every effort to enter in at the straight gate. Spare no expense to enter in at the straight gate. Many want to get into the straight gate, but they won't be able to. What's the verse before this? This is Luke 13, 24. What's 23? They said unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said, strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many will seek to enter and will not be able so, you know, this kind of like begs the question, doesn't it? Why can't they get in? Why ain't they able? Verse 27 answers that. I tell you, I don't know you, where you're from, depart from me, ye workers of KJV iniquity, other translations, whatever. The word in Greek I have highlighted in yellow, adikias, here we go, Freiburg, guess what? It's disregard for the divine law. Oh, there's a shocker. And the correlation, a nomos, Greek word. A means no, rest of the word spelled out, N-O-M-I-A, or N-O-M, 
Sometimes it's no MIA, sometimes it's no MOS, depending on the MOS, but there it is, N O M A M I A. All right, let's move now to the road traveled. Let's start with the straight gate, though. 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Sounds like it could be talking about the same thing. Wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Obviously, that's KJV. <laughs> Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth into life, and few there be to find it. Gosh, this sounds like a parallel passage, doesn't it? Well, pretty close. Now, let's move to 21. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. Really? The will of my Father? Oh, the one who does not keep my instructions continues to not love me, and the instruction which you hear is not mine but the fathers who sent me. Yeshua said this. He didn't do this on his own. Everything he said came from the Father. So we have to do the will of the Father, which is in heaven. Continuing to 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in the name, cast out devils, done many wonderful works? Sounds like to me, power gifts. Rockin'. They were rejected for one reason. What is the reason they're rejected? I never knew you. A nomos. Let's go to Freiburg. That which is contrary to what the law requires. Another shocker in definition. Now, what should we do if we are concerned? Paul gives us the answer. Examine yourselves to determine if you are in the faith. Now, what do we know from Revelation? The saints keep the commandments of God. Well, that's what he said we have to do. And possess the witness of Yeshua. You find that in two places. How? Check out your road. It's very simple. Look around where you are. Got a lot of people. Road kind of wide, kind of look like rush hour on Friday afternoon on a holiday weekend. Might be the wrong road. The text says, few there be to find it. Um, are you in the few or are you in the many? If your road looks wide and it looks like a lot of people are going down that road, you might want to just take Paul up on his suggestion in 2 Corinthians 13.5, examine yourselves to determine if you're in the faith. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test everything, grasp a hold of that which is true. This is what is being recommended. What road are you on? Take a look around and then make a decision. The time is coming. You still can make a decision, but eventually the time will end. Are you ready to enforce Torah today? Have you even read it? Something to consider. I leave it with you. Thank you.